Well, good morning, everybody. Great to be with you today. Hey, um, do you have, are any of you familiar with like the cheesy like leadership posters that you see in break rooms at like work or maybe in your high school classroom? We had one in my senior English class that said like uh, follow your dreams, and then it said shoot for the moon, and if you miss, you'll land among the stars. You know what I'm talking about? Which they kind of irritate me because um, first of all, it, you can't really shoot for the moon like that, and if you if you miss, you're not going to land among the stars anyway. So it's astronomically incorrect. You'll and if you landed among the stars, you'd burn your eyes out and you'd die. So. There's really nothing positive about that. So when I was in college, I had a friend who had a very sarcastic sense of humor, and he introduced me to demotivational posters. Anybody seen these ones? Because these are far more accurate. And he had one framed, he had it in his, his dorm room, and I thought to myself, man, one day when I have an office, if I have an office, I would love to get one of those and frame it. And then I started working in a church, I'm like, I can't put those in my, in my office. But it won't stop me from sharing some with you this morning. And so I want to show a couple of those. Matthew, here's the first one. Ambition, the journey of a thousand miles sometimes ends very, very badly. Okay. I mean, it's just really true, isn't it? Okay, here we go. Next one. Consulting. If you're not a part of the solution, there's good money to be made in prolonging the problem. <laughs> Painful. Next one. Mediocrity. It takes a lot less time, and most people won't notice the difference until it's too late. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, next one. Caution. Life doesn't always want to be grabbed by the horns. <laughs> oh, goodness. Procrastination. This is a good one. Hard work often pays off after time, but laziness always pays off now. <laughs> Anyone else relate to that one? <laughs> yeah, okay. And here's, here's my favorite of them. Individuality, always remember that you are unique just like everybody else. <clears throat> that was before Donald Trump came along. I mean, this poster was like 10 years old, you know, before Donald Trump came along referring to young people as snowflakes. And so that's what I find particularly funny about that one. See, now, I grew up in the 1980s, which was on the verge of the Your Special generation. If you know what I'm talking about, it's kind of like, you can be whatever you want to be. And I remember at kindergarten, we took a field trip to the hospital, and at the end, they let, got, let you choose, you know, are you going to be a doctor, a nurse, and, you know, follow your dreams. You can be whatever you want to be. And then this kind of generation from the 80s and 90s grew up, and we gave participation trophies to everybody, and everybody gets an A because we don't want anybody to have a bad self-esteem about anything that they have. And so follow your dreams, whatever it is that you want to do, whether it's beneficial to society or the world or anyone else, just follow your dreams, do what you want, and, you know, that's wonderful for you, and nothing will stop you as long as you put your mind and heart to it, and you'll get whatever you want. And then you kind of couple that kind of mentality that was baked into some of us growing up in the 80s, 90s with some of the technological changes in our world. And I don't know if, you know, we've kind of talked about this in recent weeks, but, you know, grew up in a house with one television, but then over time there are multiple televisions and suddenly, you know, you don't have to watch what everybody else is watching and then all of a sudden it's on demand and I can get whatever I want when I want it. Or there was an, in, uh, an invention in the 1980s the Walkman. Anybody remember the Walkman? I mean, that just revolutionized music because now I can listen to what I want and I can put it on my headphones and I can be in the car on vacation. I can listen to what I want. I don't have to listen to what my parents are listening to. And then the CDs came along. Remember CDs? That was a great invention because it had this beautiful feature called skip. <laughs> and you didn't have to listen to songs you didn't want to listen to. For those of you young people in the room who don't know what I'm talking about, we had these things called tapes, okay? And some of you are even older than that, and you had records and eight tracks and stuff, but that's before me. And so um, we had tapes, and if you wanted to skip a song, you had to kind of fast forward and hope you got to the right spot. And if not, you had to rewind a little bit or fast forward a little bit more. And, and so it was just a pain, so you listened to stuff you didn't want. But when CDs came, you could repeat your favorite songs, you could skip over ones you didn't want. And then the digital music revolution, remember that, when MP3s and Napster, and then you didn't even have to buy music, you could just steal it from somebody else's computer until Napster got sued, and then all of a sudden, you know, then you could at least, if you wanted to have integrity, buy the songs you wanted to listen to, and everything became on demand. I mean, our whole world kind of became on demand, and without even realizing it, over time, I think our world has become very me-centric. Our world became very me-centric, and it became about what I want to listen to, when I want to listen to it, what I want to watch, when I want to watch it, you know, you got your special um, individualized, personalized ringtones. I saw a commercial a couple of weeks ago for Nissan. They've got this new car where you can personalize everything about it and, you know, just go use their app and you can make it whatever you want it to be. And before we know it, or before we realize it, we became very centered on me 
me, me, what I want, what I want, what I want. And then Amazon Prime came along. That was great, you know, about 10 years ago, because not only can I watch what I want to watch or listen to what I want to listen to, I can have it shipped to me in two days, right? And anybody else annoyed when somebody else doesn't ship something in two days? You know, you order something and it's not there, and you think to yourself, who are these people? Get a, come on, get a clue, you know? We're in the 21st century. It's 2018 now. You ought to be able to get your acts together and give me what I want when I want it. And there's a common theme that kind of has come up as a part of our world, and actually it's not just a part of our world. I think it's existed for a long, long time. And the theme is me first. Me first, what I want, when I want it, individualized, personalized, when I want to have it, when I want to listen to it. And in the process, I can't help but wonder if we've missed something really, really important. And so today we're beginning this new series, Living Upside Down in a Me First World. And the truth is, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus stepped onto the scene, he stepped onto the scene in a Me First World, just like we live in a Me First World. It was a little different, but similar. And instead of living Me First, Jesus did something very different, and he did something very unique, and he turned the world upside down. So we're going to explore a little bit about that this morning. If you've got a Bible, you may want to open it up. We're going to be in the book of Matthew this morning. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. There are four books that tell us of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you may not know it, but Matthew was one of Jesus' followers. So he wrote this book after he had spent years, you know, uh, living with Jesus, traveling with Jesus, hearing Jesus teach and speak, and watching Jesus perform miracles and healings. And what's interesting about Matthew is he was a tax collector. And if anybody lived me first in the Jewish culture and the Jewish world 2,000 years ago, it was the tax collectors because they purchased the right from Rome to be able to levy taxes on people and they had to pay Rome the taxes for the people, but they could charge whatever they wanted and there were no checks and balances. And so tax collectors were extremely wealthy because uh, the Jewish people had to pay taxes when they would cross bridges, when they would go on certain roads, when they would buy certain products and it all, much of it went to Caesar to pay for Rome, but much of it went into the pockets of the tax collectors until one day Jesus came to Matthew and he said hey do you want to follow me do you want to follow me and Matthew agreed that he would follow Jesus because there had never been another rabbi who had ever probably talked to him before since tax collectors were so hated so he began following Jesus and so he recorded Jesus life for us and there's a particular interchange we're going to take a look at in Matthew chapter 16 now If you've been with us for a while, you've probably heard some of these verses before, and I'll give you a heads up that it might be a little bit familiar, but we're going to move a little bit beyond the verses you may be familiar with, so I've got to give a little background, and that's what the first part is going to be. Um, But Jesus was traveling with his disciples. They were on the way to Jerusalem, and he asked them an important question that could sound very me-centered and me-first, and the question was, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? Now, the reason why Jesus asked that question wasn't because he wanted to focus on himself. He was trying to help the disciples understand who he actually was. And so that's kind of where we pick things up. They begin answering his question. So Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 14, here's what happens. It says, they replied, the disciples, some say John the Baptist. Now, if you're new to Bible study, John the Baptist was an eccentric a prophet who lived in Jesus' time. Um, John the Baptist lived out in the wilderness. He ate locusts and honey. He was the type of eccentric person you're not sure you would want your kids to hang out with, you know? And when people went out there, he had this turn or burn message of, you know, and then repent, repent, the kingdom of God is coming, repent, be baptized. He's the first person who actually baptized people. That's where we get the example of baptism. And so as far as we know, he was the first one to do it. So, so the disciples say, some think you're John the Baptist, who, by the way, had been beheaded um, by Herod, but uh, I think it was Herod. And then others say Elijah. Elijah was another prophet from the nation of Israel from the time of the kings. It's believed that Elijah didn't die, that a chariot of fire came down from heaven and swooped him up and took him up into heaven. So There's like, you know, some people think you're John the Baptist, this eccentric prophet preacher guy. Some people think, you know, you're you're Elijah, this prophet from old times. And still others, they said, Jeremiah are one of the prophets. In other words, people don't really know who you are, Jesus. (laughs) We know they know there's something special and something different and unique about you, but they're not really sure what. So Jesus changed the question. He said, okay, what about you? What about you? Who do you say I am? Now, I want to pause the story here for just a second because it's possible you're in here today and maybe this is your first time in church or you're not really sure what you believe about Jesus or who Jesus is, and this is a really important question. 
Who do you say I am? Who do you think Jesus is? Because the way you answer this question will really influence your understanding of what we're going to take a look at today. Now, in our world, in our culture, there are lots of views about Jesus. One of the predominant views is Jesus is, was a great teacher. I mean, you ask anybody, was Jesus a good teacher? And everybody says yes. But what's a little ironic about that is Jesus also made the statement of, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. And he said, I am the Son of God. And so a good teacher wouldn't necessarily tell you that unless it were true. So if it weren't true, then that makes him a liar, and that wouldn't make him a good teacher, right? I mean, you wouldn't say he's a good teacher, you'd say he's a liar. If he really believed it, he wasn't lying about it, if he really believed it and it still wasn't true, then we'd call him crazy. We'd say he's a lunatic. C.S. Lewis kind of used this line of reasoning, he's a liar, he's a lunatic, we'd lock him up in a loony bin. But you know what, 2,000 years later, here we are still looking at things that Jesus said, and, and we'd say they're not words of a crazy person. I mean, they're words of somebody who really knew what he was talking about. So the third option is that not only did he believe he was the Son of God, he really was the Son of God, that he's the Lord. And so that's kind of the options that are laid out before us. And so whether or not you know who Jesus is or you have an idea of who Jesus is, I think you should wrestle with that, and I think you should Think about that because, as I said, how you respond to that question has a great influence on your understanding of what Jesus is about to say. So who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Well, Simon Peter spoke up. You may be familiar with this. And Simon Peter answered, verse 16, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Like, Jesus, you're the one we've been waiting for. You're the promised Messiah from Old Testament days, except it wasn't Old Testament in their mindset. It was just, you know, the, the historic days of our people. You're the one we're waiting for. You're the one who's going to help us conquer Rome because the Jewish people were under Roman, impre- Roman oppression. And he's thinking, you're the one we've been, we've been waiting for. You're the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And Jesus replied, verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you, by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. Now, he had been called Simon up to this point in time, but suddenly his name gets changed. Jesus says, this is such a big deal, this is such a big understanding that you came up with that I'm going to rename you Peter, which means stone or rock. It was kind of a play on words. He says, and on this rock, I will build my church, and we've been talking about this through our last series, a congregation, I'll build my gathering, I'll build my following of people, and the gates of Hades or hell will not overcome it. In other words, nothing's going to stop it. And so, Peter, you're the one, you're the one that is going to help lead this whole organization. He said, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Peter, you're going to lead this thing. Now, think about what Peter was thinking at this point in time. As, as he, you know, they're, they're waiting for Rome to be taken down. They're waiting for a Messiah to come. And Jesus is like, you're right, Peter. I am the Messiah. I am the one who's coming. And you're going to help lead this thing. I mean, that's kind of exciting, isn't it? <laughs> it's really exciting. And what a prediction this was by Jesus. Because if you know much about the history of Christianity, you know that Peter did lead the church. That Peter was the first kind of preacher of Christianity, that Peter, if you grew up in a Catholic context, he was the first pope. I mean, you know, Peter was the man. He was a significant guy, and he's thinking, I'm going to lead this incredible army to crush and to destroy Rome, because that's what a Messiah does. A Messiah in the line of David, remember David from Old Testament times, the one who slew the giant, who slew Goliath? who put down all of Israel's enemies, who ushered in a time of peace, who paved the way to the prosperity that would come through David's son Solomon. I mean, they're thinking, you know, this is great. Peter's going to lead this awesome organization, this awesome movement as they put down Rome under their mighty thumb. Except that wasn't what Jesus was going to do. It wasn't what Jesus was going to do at all. In fact, he wasn't going to come as some mighty Messiah. He was going to come as one who would suffer. And when he was taken away by an angry mob, rather than fighting for his life and pulling out the sword, in fact, you may know the story, Peter had a sword, and he pulled it out, and he cut off the high priest's servant's ear, And Jesus said, Peter, put your sword away. That's not my way. And he healed the guy's ear. And Peter's thinking to himself, what are you doing? You know, you don't just lay down and die. And yet that's what the Messiah did. That's what Jesus did. Rather than fighting, 
He gave up his life. And so Jesus did not come to be the Messiah that Peter and the rest of the disciples were anticipating or expecting. In fact, to the contrary. And so, so Jesus said something that was a little bit crazy when you think about it. Verse 20 says, Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Now think about the lunacy of that. The Messiah who's coming and is going to, you know, usher in a new era and a new kingdom, and you don't want people to know? I mean, that doesn't even make sense. Don't you want people to sign up for Team Jesus and join the club and, you know, pull out their swords and be ready to conquer Rome? I mean, isn't that what you want, Jesus? And yet he said, no, 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 they're not going to understand. They're going to expect me to be that type of Messiah, but that's not the type of Messiah I'm going to be. That's not how I'm going to conquer Rome. In fact, verse 21, it says, from that time on, in other words, after they had understood this, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now, I'm telling you, his disciples at this point in time, as they're listening to him talk about suffering and dying and, you know, coming back to life and stuff, they're thinking to themselves, no, 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 that, that's not what a Messiah does. Messiahs don't do that. Messiahs use their power and their authority, and they crush the opponents. They don't suffer, and they don't die. You have to understand, the picture that Jesus painted of a Messiah was a revolting picture. It wasn't a picture that anybody wanted to follow. I mean, you think about messiahs that lay over kings that aren't very powerful. What happens to kings that aren't very powerful? They get overthrown, right? I mean, they've got a brother or a son or a brother-in-law who kind of takes them over and shuts down their, you know, their rule. And then there was King Herod. I don't know if you remember King Herod. He was the king when Jesus was born. He was a powerful king, right? I mean, he was really powerful. In fact, King Herod, when he heard that a baby was born who was going to, you know, be the king of the Jews, he had all the other babies killed, I mean, that's how powerful he was. And when his son tried to take his throne from him, he had his son executed. That's what a powerful king does. And so there's there's Jesus talking about laying down and dying and suffering. And Peter's thinking to himself, that's not the kingdom I signed up to lead. You know, when I said you're the Messiah, the son of the living God, I mean, I'm not thinking, yeah, let me lead that. That's no good. Because if you die, Jesus, then I die and everybody else dies. And so, so Peter, we don't really know if he was nominated by the other disciples or if he just decided to take it upon himself. But he pulls Jesus aside and tries to set him straight. Here's what happens. Um, uh, verse 22 it says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, the word rebuke, we don't use that a lot, but it just means to denounce, or it means to, to give strong disapproval. And we don't know the tone in which Peter said this, but we can kind of guess, and so my tone may not be accurate to what he, what he said, but I think it was something along the lines of, never, Lord, never, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. This is not what a Messiah does. This is not the strength that we need to see in these moments. Remember, remember Jesus when you changed my name to Peter, which meant stone, like rock, is strong. I like that. Rock, stone has a good sound, good ring to it. And so, I mean, that's what we're talking about. A Messiah comes in strength and power. A Messiah is not weak. And so Peter, I mean, he's like trying to talk some sense into Jesus, like snap out of it, man. I mean, you're not, come on, you want people to follow you? Good grief, you've got to change this message and we've got to change the tone and let's meet with a marketing guy and figure this out. But stop the dying and death talk, for goodness sakes. But look what happens, verse 23, Jesus turned and he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You just called me stone, like rock. You know, that was kind of cool. And now you're calling me Satan? Peter, Peter, you're being influenced by the devil. That is not my way. He goes on. He says, you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Do you know what the human way of doing things is? The human way of doing things is using my power and my authority to leverage for my sake and to push people in the direction that I want them to go in. I mean, look back even to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were first there and suddenly they have, you know, the apple that they can eat because God is withholding something good from them and they're going to use their power, their authority to give them something good that they are missing because it's me first. 
In fact, in Matthew chapter 4, and we're not going to take time to read it, but I encourage you to read it later on today or sometime this week. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is taken into the wilderness, and he's tempted by the devil. And in one of his temptations, he's taken up to the top of the temple mount, and and Satan kind of has him look over all the kingdoms of the world. He says, I want you to look at all these things, Jesus, and then I'll tell you what. If you just bow down to me right now, I'll give them all to you. You don't have to suffer and die. You don't have to go through the embarrassment of the cross. Nobody has to know. If you just do what I'm asking you to do, I'll give you all of this. And you know what Jesus said in those moments? He didn't say, well, that's a really stupid offer because they're not yours to offer anyway. No. Because he understood that Satan's been given temporary dominion over this world. And one day he'll come back in power and he'll take that from him. But until that time... Satan is in control of this. And so Jesus, rather than bowing down and doing what Satan wanted him to do, he said, no, no, no. It's written, worship the Lord your God and him alone. And I'm not going to bow down to you. That's the way the world operates. That's how the kingdoms of this world operate, through power, through strength, through might. When Jesus looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, it's like, this is not the way that my kingdom operates operates my kingdom is different see the way of this world is using your authority to leverage your power for your benefit the way of this world is using your authority to leverage your power for your benefit it's me first it's me first it's what i want it's what's good for me it's looking to my needs first It's using people and things and opportunities for my sake. It's individuality, celebrating who I'm created to be and what fulfills me and what's important to me. And Jesus looked Peter in the face. He said, that's not my way. That is not my way. My way is different. My way is not me first. And Jesus in those moments, don't miss this, it's so important. Jesus in those moments, he looked at Peter, he looked at the 11, as we're about to see here in a second, and I think he looks at every one of us and he recognizes that there's a piece of us that's in it for us, isn't there? I mean, there's a piece of us that's in it for us, and whether it comes down to faith, because, I mean, you could be a Christian and a follower of Jesus, and yet there's still a piece of us that's, that's in it for us. There's a piece of the way I serve that's in it for me, and it comes down to whether it's convenient for me and whether it fills my time, or the way that I give, whether or not it's the way I want the money to be spent, and I, I want to be able to control that. There's a piece of the way that I, you know, have my relationships that's in it for me, and I'm more concerned about me and what I want and my time and my control and me me, 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 and Jesus looked that straight in the eye and said, get behind me, Satan, because that is not my way. Me first is not in my kingdom. See, the general message of Christianity isn't follow Jesus and life becomes easy and, you know, name it and claim it and get whatever you want and your kids will never have any problems and you'll just rise the ladder at work and everything will go perfectly and there will be puppies and ponies all along the way and no cats because everybody hates cats or most of us do. I mean, everything will be perfect and wonderful, you know. Sorry, that was for the cat lovers in there. And yet, in the midst of that, Jesus put such an end and an uncomfortable end to that line of thinking. In fact, he, he smacked it straight in the face, and look what he said next. This is, this is amazing. I mean, if Jesus was trying to gather a following of people, this was not the thing to say. <laughs> he said to his disciples, verse 24, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And I mean, we kind of want to push back and say, Jesus, deny myself. Don't you mean like live for myself? Don't you mean, you know, do what I want for myself? I mean, let's be honest. Deny yourself. Where have you heard that message in our culture? Nowhere. I mean, it's not deny yourself unless it's some fad diet that you're on for a while. There is no deny yourself. It's indulge yourself. Give you what you want. Live a me first life in this me first world. And yet Jesus said, no, no, no. If you're going to be my follower, 
you're going to have to say no to yourself at some point in time. This is a great motivational speech, wasn't it? And then it was take up your cross. Take up your cross. Now think about this. I mean, because, you know, 21st century Americans, we have warm fuzzies when we think about crosses. We wear them around our neck, tattoo them on ourselves and stuff. But 2,000 years ago, I'm just telling you, the cross struck fear in people. The cross was a symbol of death. It would be the equivalent of us putting like little gold electric chairs around our necks, right? I mean, 2,000 years ago, when people heard the cross, it wasn't warm fuzzies. It was like, this is your life, and this is Rome's dominion of your life. Roman citizens weren't killed by the cross. They were beheaded. But the colonists of Rome, they were killed by the cross, and they were killed by the cross when they were insurrectionists, when they rose up against Rome. And so Rome would say, if you fight against us, you will lose, and we will give you a cross beam, and we will strip you naked and you will walk through the streets and people will mock you and laugh at you and throw things at you and curse at you and, and there you will die the most painful death imaginable. You will be an embarrassment to everybody who knows you. You'll be an embarrassment to your family and to yourself because Rome wins every single time. And the disciples knew that. And Jesus says, take up your cross. Take up your cross. Give up you. Say no to you and say yes to me and follow me. Now, it's kind of amazing, isn't it, that Jesus even had followers after making statements like this? In fact, there's a, 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 a point in time where Jesus is talking with his disciples and he teaches them something and, and all the crowds, they start to dwindle away. And the reason why they dwindle away, they're like, it's just getting weird, man. <laughs> no, I'm not sure I want this anymore. And so Jesus looks at his disciples and he says to them, are you guys going to go too? Are you guys going to go too? And Peter in that moment, it was a little bit beyond this in the timeline of Jesus' life. Peter looks at Jesus and says, where are we going to go? You've given us the keys to life. Because the truth is, and you and I know it, living life for the sake of of my life and you living your life for the sake of your life, it's not very satisfying, is it? I mean, this piece of us that's in it for us, we wake up in the middle of the night and we think, is this all there is to life? I mean, my life doesn't even really have a whole lot of purpose and I have all these toys and I've accomplished all these things, but what was it for? And I'm telling you, it's into that that Jesus speaks and he says, come follow me. Come follow me. The cool thing about the invitation to follow is you can follow wherever you are in the faith journey. You may be here today and you're just kind of investigating who Jesus is and you don't really know if you believe he's the son of God yet or not, but you can take a step in his direction and you can begin to follow him. Or it's possible you've been following Jesus for a while or you've been in church at least for a while because let's be honest, you don't have to be in church or you don't have to, just because you're in church doesn't mean you're following Jesus. You could spend your whole life in church and never actually follow him, never deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. And so it could be a point in time anywhere along the spectrum, anywhere in your steps to say, okay, now I'm going to choose to follow. I'm going to take a step in his direction. But it's always a choice. Jesus never forced people into following. He never has forced people into following. But the good news is, it's not all doom and gloom because as I said, living life for me never actually satisfies me. Isn't that the ironic part about it? I mean, you look at divorce rates in our culture, you look at satisfaction, happiness rates, you look at teenagers who are battling depression, and we have so much. We have so much, and yet it leads us nowhere. And Jesus knew it, <laughs> which is why he said this next. He said, for whoever, and just so you know, whoever is whoever, it's anyone, it doesn't matter how successful you are, how slick you are, how much you can, you know, finagle things for your own benefit, how much money you have, you know, how much you've enjoyed retirement, how successful you were in life, how much church you had, whoever. He said, whoever wants to save their life, and he's talking about being me-focused, living life for my life. He says, whoever wants to, to save their life will lose it. And quite honestly, I mean, just pull up a news feed somewhere. Look at what's happening in Hollywood with all our famous stars or our athletes. I mean, they've lost their lives. They live their lives for their lives, and they lost it. Then he goes on, he says, but whoever loses their life 
for me. Whoever chooses to live upside down, whoever says it's not going to be me first, will find it. And he says, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? You spend your whole life living for your life and you realize that you lost your life and what good was it? You lost the very thing that was your life, your soul, the part of you, the piece of you that makes you, you. The part that you tried to control but you realize you can't. And Jesus says, look, my kingdom is different. Power and glory don't come to those who try and be strong. It comes to those who give up their lives for me. He said this, Verse 27, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Because the ways of this world will pass. The me-first world will not survive. But a life that's lived for the sake of Jesus, somebody who's willing to deny himself and take up his cross and follow Jesus, that will survive. What matters what last, Jesus says, are my kingdom and my values. To sum it all up, he basically said, look, if you live your life for yourself, you'll end up with only yourself, and eventually you'll lose yourself. But if you give up yourself, you'll get something greater than yourself, and you'll never lose it. Because in his kingdom, things work differently. It's not me first. It's the opposite of me first, where the weak are the powerful ones, where you give your life in order to gain it, where you leverage what you have for his sake and you earn a reward. So as we kind of bring all this to a close, there are two important questions I want you to be thinking about. And I put these in the first person because I want you to really just say it in your mind, think about it. The first question is this, am I living a me first life? Am I living a me first life? Now, before you answer no, I'm gonna make an argument that you're an American. And so the answer is yes, or at least most of you in the room are American. I think it's virtually impossible to live in this country and not live a me first life. I mean, that's just kind of how we're trained. That's what we're taught from childhood, to follow the dream, you know, the American dream, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Live life however you want to live it. Enjoy it. It's all up to you. But the problem with that, as we said, is that it doesn't lead to pleasure and and happiness. It It leads to dissatisfaction and disappointment and ultimately death. And if you've ever found yourself with your head on the pillow at night thinking, you know what, I'm lying next to this person. I thought we were in love at one point in time, but now I'm realizing we both pursued this me first life and I maybe should, I mean, it's like a stranger. I'm next to a stranger. Or I've been trying to, you know, push my kids in a certain direction, give them the opportunities that I think that they should have. Or I've been trying to control things. I've got all the toys in the world, and yet there's no satisfaction. Then I'm telling you, there is an invitation for you in that place. There's an invitation. Because Jesus is saying, follow me. Follow me. In order to do so, you might have to deny yourself, though. Which means saying no to a piece of you that wants to control a piece of you that thinks that you should be in control. Now, I don't know what that piece is, and you know what the best way to know that piece is? It's the thing that you hope that I don't say, (laughs) right? I mean, it's the thing that you hope, well, I hope he doesn't bring up my relationship that I know I shouldn't be in, or I know it's not the way God created me to be, or I know that, you know, there's something wrong about this, or I hope he doesn't say money because that would make me uncomfortable, and I like to control that, or I hope he doesn't say, you know, my time because I like to control my time. I hope he doesn't say my work or, you know, my kids or whatever. I mean, you know, fill in the blank. Whatever it is that you think, man, I hope Seth doesn't and say that thing, that's probably the area of your life that God's asking you to hand over to him and to deny yourself and to take up your cross and follow him. That's the area that he's leaning into. It's the thing that when you open the Bible, if you open the pages and turn them or open your app and read it, you kind of skip over those verses (laughs) because they make you a little uncomfortable. It's the piece that when you're praying, you know, you avoid a certain thing or avoid a certain topic because you just know that, you know, that's a piece of you that you want to control. And Jesus says, you're never going to find life doing that. The only way to live your life is to actually give it up. And you know the beautiful thing? Jesus didn't ask the disciples to give it all up at once. 
You know, I think sometimes that's a fear because sometimes, you know, you're, you're just at this stage where, where he just wants you to take a step. He just wants you to move in his direction. And my guess is there's a piece that's me-centered in your world, that's me first in your world, and he's inviting you to hand it over to him and to take a step in his direction and to see what he might do in your life. So the second question is this. It's what in my me-first world keeps me from following Jesus? What is it? What's the thing that you hold on to and you think, this is my, this is for me, this is for my pleasure, this is for my enjoyment, this is for my life? I'm telling you, Jesus is looking at that thing and said, it's not actually giving you life, it's stealing your life. It is taking your life from you, and so I'm inviting you to hand it over to me. And when you do that, and when you make a decision and say, God, I'm going to give this to you, it scares me to death because I'm comfortable with this, it's how I've lived, it's what I've known, I'm comfortable, but I'm trusting that it may be getting in the way of me actually following you. And so I'm gonna hand it over to you and I'm gonna trust you to step in and do something in it. And if you wanna give it back to me, that's fine, you can give it back to me, but until then, I'm just going to trust you. And I'm telling you, it's in that space, it's in that place that God meets us and he helps us to take a step in the direction of following him, and he moves us away from living in this me-first world, and he enables us to begin and continue taking a step toward Jesus. So what in your me-first world keeps you from following him, and would you take a step of faith to move in his direction? Because here's the thing. You and I never know what hangs in the balance of our decision to follow Jesus. We never know. The disciples at this point in time when Jesus said, you know, you're going to have to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me, they had no idea what was hanging in the balance. They weren't ready to give up their lives. They weren't ready to die, although most of them, if not all, except for John, did. They weren't ready to do that. They just were taking a step. And you know what? They ended up writing best-selling books. And people 2,000 years later know who Matthew and James and John are and Peter and they name their kids after them. How many, we, we don't name our kids Caesar, we name our dog Caesar. They had no idea what God was going to do in their lives. They had no idea what hung in their balance of being willing to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow Jesus. And you don't know either. Because there is life that God wants to give you and it rests on your willingness to deny yourself, to take up your cross, and to follow him. I know that's kind of heavy, but I want to invite you to be thinking about that in the coming week, and next week we're going to pick up where we left off, and it's not going to be as heavy next week, but this is an important place for us to sit and rest. So let me pray for us as we close our time. God, thank you so much for this (laughs) difficult invitation. I'm not sure that Jesus would have gotten too many marks for being a motivational speaker, and yet the truth is it is an incredible invitation for us. And living life for ourselves, the way we're taught to live it, doesn't bring the satisfaction that we think it's going to bring us, as evidenced by everything going around in our culture and the stories we read and the Facebook feeds we look at. And so, God, would you give us courage to take a step in your direction? and to hand something over to you and to invite you into a difficult place in our lives where we have this need to control. And would you give us the courage to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow you. And God, I invite you to just give us wisdom to know what we need to do with what we've heard today. And Father, then give us courage to do it. We pray these things in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.